Full Metal Jacket was about war. He wanted to make a film about men and women, which was Eyes Wide Shut. He wanted to make a film about Napoleon, which didn't happen because of financing and all that. He wanted to make a film about the Holocaust. But it was like someone who wanted to make films about things that interested him, that he could, that he could investigate, get his arms around and, and find out things. And Yes? That's absolutely true. He wanted to make films that uh, mattered, that had not only good form, but also substance. And while his films are all very different from each other in form, they are not that different if you look very closely, because there is something that connects them all, and that is a very serious look at uh, human nature. In 1927, the first picture with sound was released, titled The Jazz Singer. Some folks have won, some folks have none. Later that year, the German science fiction film Metropolis was released. Same year Kubrick was born, 1928, Charlie Chaplin comedy The Circus premiered in January. Disney introduced Mickey Mouse and Steve to Willie. RKO Productions Incorporation was created in late October. It was a company that Kubrick would collaborate with many times. On July 26, 1928, in New York, Stanley Kubrick, the American filmmaker, rose soon to be the most influential and critical acclaimed filmmaker during our cinematic history. He died at the age of 70 in 1999, shortly after Eyes Wide Shut was finished. <laughs> How did you feel about Eyes Wide Shut? I've uh, lived with the story for a long time because he read it in, oh, ages ago and yeah. in 68 when 2001 came out. He, yeah. he was going to do that next. And uh, From after 2001, he yeah. was going to be that? He, he, he thought, I, I've got it. And, and I was, we, we were very young still, and I thought that is a very moisture seeking story, uh, very uncomfortable. Stanley grew up with his father Jack, who worked as a doctor, and his mother Sadie, a housewife, together with his younger sister Barbara. His relatives immigrated from Austria as his grandparents moved from Europe to New York. When his parents got married by the time Stanley was born, they moved to the Bronx. Kubrick's father had some influence on his life, as he was the one who taught him chess and gave him his first film camera. No, I, uh, uh, I had uh, few intellectual interests. As a child, I uh, uh, 
uh, was a school misfit and considered, uh, you know, reading a book, um, schoolwork. And I, I don't think I read a book for pleasure until after I graduated high school. By 1946, he graduated from William Howard Taft High School. Education was not something Kubrick appreciated most of his youth, as he thought learning was boring. It disappointed his father, even if Stanley's IQ was rated above average, but his grades were not good enough. However, it wasn't Taft he got the eye for photography and the appreciation for it. Kubrick found also interest in both jazz and playing the drums. When the American president Franklin D. Roosevelt died in April 1945, Kubrick took a photo of the Look magazine board for $25. Kubrick returned often to the magazine to sell more picture as editor Helen O'Brien gained interest in his work. Because of this, Stanley got a job as an apprentice photographer at Look Magazine in April 1945, the same year he was 17. The job later made him become a full-time photographer at Look. Two years later, in 1948, Kubrick got married to Toba Metz at the age of 19, a girl he started to date in high school. The same year, he divorced Toba Metz. He married a second time in 1955 with Ruth Zabotka, a dancer and theatrical artist, who he divorced in 1957. A year later, he married Christian Harlan, who he had three children with. In 1951, Kubrick directed two short documentaries, Day of the Fight and Flying Padre, and quit his job as a photojournalist at Look Magazine. Day of the Fight is a short documentary from 1951 that featuring professional boxer Walter Cartier preparing for a fight, as it is in black and white. It was also based on a photo that Kubrick shot when working as a photojournalist. This is a fight fan. Fan, short for fanatic. There's a legion just like him in the United States. Each year he shoves his share of $90 million under the wicket for the privilege of attending places where matched pairs of men will get up on a canvas-covered platform and commit legal assault and lawful battery. What is the fascination? What does the fan look for? Competitive sport, scientific skill? Partly, but mostly he seeks action. Toe-to-toe, -to -toe body contact, physical violence, the triumph of force over force. The other documentary Cuba produced the same year Flying Padre, which tells the story about a priest flying sick children to hospitals with planes. You'll find Harding County in northeastern New Mexico. It's here that our story begins. Over the plateaus and canyons near the village of Mosquero, the sound of an airplane can be heard. A single... After the short documentary films, Stanley Kubrick tried his luck of a director's career. Fear and Desire was his directional debut, an anti-war movie from 1953, which he was not satisfied with. If she can't tell us anything, let's let her go. Sure, so she can run downstream to that command post and tip our hand. 
You kids and your ideas. And I get a call from Sackler saying, I saw you playing the, uh, the lead and he who gets slapped, and I think you're perfect for the part of uh, Sidney in this movie that I've written, a movie which, by the way, Stanley later tried to have the negative burned. A little did he know how much we all hated it. No, we didn't. Uh, in any case, I go to this address. Uh, I, I was from Brooklyn, and he was from the Bronx. It's a long story, but there's a payoff. I go, okay. I go there, and I ring the doorbell, and I go upstairs. I walked up three or four flights, and the door opens, and this guy with the dark eyes, a very bare uh, built room uh, with the cameras, not, not movie cameras, just cameras right. on the Stills table, magazine. still cameras. Yeah. He was working for Look Magazine. Uh, and he said to me, uh, I'm Stanley Kubrick. And I said, I'm Erwin Mazursky, which is my real name is Erwin. And I was smart. I changed it to Paul. I don't know why he changed it to Paul, but that's another story. In any case, he said, I want you to read for me. Would you read for me? I said, yeah. So I read. I have no idea what I'm reading. It took about 40 minutes. It was a very short, like, 60-page thing. He said, okay, you got the part. We leave Monday for California. I said, but I'm graduating from college. I can't, I can't do that. He said, you can do it. Go to the dean and tell him you're in a big Hollywood movie and ask for, <laughs> ask for four weeks off. So I go to the dean the next day, and lo and behold, he fell for it. He made the first major Hollywood film, The Killing, between 1955 and 1956. This was a film distributed by United Artists. The Killing follows Johnny Clay, who just got released from prison. Johnny assembles a team of five to carry out a heist robbery at the same time he wants to marry his girlfriend. The film was based on the novel Clean Break by the American novelist Lionel White. This pawned away with his two only collaboration with the legendary Kirk Douglas. The studio itself was started to even greenlight the film at first, but once Kirk Douglas was on board, the project was on the way. It was a dear project for the young director Kubrick. It didn't succeed well on the box office with the killing, but it was considered well enough to finance his upcoming work. This time wasn't well known in Hollywood. He adapted the film Path of Glory from a novel written in 1935 by Humphrey Cobb. However, it, he decided to change the ending in the film from the book and the studio executive was satisfied with the result. At one point, one executive had claimed it was, quote, one of the lousiest films they have seen, unquote. The film depicts realistic World War I battle in France and follows the story of a general defending his soldiers when they are accused of mutiny and cowardice. Path of Glory, the realistic war picture made Kubrick and Douglas a name in Hollywood and the film industry as the film itself has been selected as one of the most significant war-based films they can't help but recognize a humanity there and a common humanity. Um, and I think when people say Kubrick isn't an emotional director, I think he's actually maybe one of the most emotional directors there's ever been And that. I think he's specifically interested in how powerful the emotions are. And I think the, his eye and his use of wide-angle lenses, which can feel distancing, is actually trying to see people struggle to exist in these very difficult circumstances. So I, it's a long-winded way of saying that it, it feels in continuity with his other films. It feels there's a similar voice, but the most memorable thing about this, I feel, is really just people struggling with an absurdity, struggling to make sense of something that is incomprehensible and beyond them. And 
I think that occurs in all of his films. Small goblets. Gracchus, you know how Crassus loathes him. Mm, take him away. Uh, I can't lift it. Well, use your imagination. Cover him. Tell Marcellus to get the men ready. Crassus has a... Kubrick continued to collaborate with Kirk Douglas later on with Spartacus, an epic adventure film released in 1960. That Stanley Kubrick, you know, you know, felt it was one of his best films, and I think he kind of he sort of disavowed himself of it after the experience of shooting it. But I had talked, in my knowing of Stanley for 19 years, I had talked to Stanley a number of times about it. And I think what he liked the best, and I think what I liked the best about that picture, are all the scenes between Charles Lawton and Peter Ustinov. I, I think that was, that was a duel without swords. And that was about wit. It was about playing chess with, your, with, 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 with a person who you're not sure is your best friend who could save your life or someone who could condemn you to the cross. And, and I thought that was some of the most exciting moments in Spartacus were the one-on-one -on -one scenes between Lawton and Ustinov. Uh, they were delightful. There I was, better than a millionaire in the morning, penniless refugee by nightfall, with nothing but these rags and my poor flesh to call my own. And all because Crassus decides to break his journey at Capua with a couple of capricious, over-painted nymphs. Even actors like Marlon Brando approached him to direct One Eyed Yaks from 1961, but Brando ended up directing the film on his own. Well, you know, knowing how you was in them days, I figured you for getting drunk and falling down in some chiquita and losing track of time. <laughs> Tender, dreamy childishness. Lolita. A comedy drama from 1962 is a film that's probably one of Kubrick's lesser known work as this film was between Path of Glory and Dr. Strangelove. The film tells the story about a literature lecture that becomes sexually obsessed with a printing girl. During the film's pre-productions, Kubrick faced many problems regarding the casting choices of the actors. Peter Sellers' role as Clara Quilty has met with some critic both from readers and from viewers for what the film did not work out as planned. It's your mother. Really? She gave me time off for good behavior or something? No, she hasn't been feeling very well. What's the matter with her? She's sick. Really? What is it? James Mason, who after many discussions with other actors for the lead, was cast for the film. Lolita has some erotic and explicit content, so therefore the story was censored. Lolita was played by Sue Lyon, who are in the film 14 years old. The book's author, Vladimir Nabokov, also wrote the screenplay, but Kubrick did of course not use it. The film is part of the more forgettable repertoire from the famed director. It didn't succeed as well as the others, and it hasn't been that well received, but it's still considered a good decent film. Next film for Kubrick was Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, a black satiric comedy from 1964. It has a cast of Peter Sellers, George C. Scott, Sterling Hayden, and Slim Pickens, where Peter Sellers plays at least four roles in the film. The narrative follows a general that tries to trigger a nuclear bomb in a war room during the Cold War while other generals tries to stop him. By far this is the most popular comedy Kubrick has directed for the time. It was Oscars nominated four times and is still to modern times regarded as the best comedy. See one person play that many characters and to play each one of them differently and each one so committed, especially, you know, Dr. Strangelove himself. We will know that the here is that we, we've gathered together enough uh, animals that we could slaughter. <coughs> and then we, you know, that was the first time you, you saw people suffering from Waldheimers. My favorite was when he was having the discussion with uh, 
he's trying to get the codes and uh, he's basically, the general's saying, uh, Mandrake, they want my precious bodily fluids. That's why I don't, I don't partake of women and that's why I only drink pure wood grain alcohol. That's wonderful. <laughs> Peter Sellers' role of Thor was agreed after his successful performance from Lolita. Compared to the other films, this film had intentionally production in England. This was due to Sellers' divorce and was at the time unable to leave London. This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. Very well tempered by uh, the somewhat uh, cynical observation that uh, poor and mediocre pictures might just as well prove successful as their pictures of higher value. Television has changed this completely, and uh, I think that despite the unhappy financial upheaval that it has caused in the movie industry, it has also provided a very invigorating and stimulating challenge which has made it necessary for films to be made with more sincerity and more daring. If Hollywood uh, lacks the color and excitement of its early days, with Rolls Royces and leopard skin seat covers, I think on the other hand it provides the most exciting and stimulating atmosphere of opportunity and possibilities for young people today. A Space Odyssey from 1968 remains to this day a frontier of its collection of masterpieces. It is the culmination of its works. With a time span of three years in the making, it is still regarded as a film that defines his vision and structure. In a visual aspect, the film itself gives a more groundbreaking and technical achievement which has inspired the filmmakers even 50 years later. The ability to over 50 years to inspire with its themes and clarification what made 2001 A Space Odyssey what it is today. It is a masterpiece with so many elements intact. Kubrick understood how to visually engage our audience in a story set in space and as a director this was his main attribute to use this, this potential whenever he could, which is visible in his later works. In the 70s, Stanley Kubrick moved on to other projects, one of more prominent and characteristic work during this decade. What's, and look, um, you know, it was really very concerning to me that um, I make it watchable for an audience. Watchable and um, find somewhere, which is rare in a Kubrick movie, someone that's sympathetic in any shape or form. You know, he doesn't do sympathetic characters that well. And uh, so uh, I was determined to make, to make him, without cheating, um, to make him at least watchable. Back in 1971, A Clockwork Orange premiered with Malcolm McDowell in the leading role as Alex, who leads a criminal gang in a futuristic and dystopian Britain. Based on the novel by Anthony Burgess with the same name, released in 1962, follows Alex as he commits crimes, raping and ultraviolence. Well, questioning morality in society and behavior psychology. For its first run, it got protested it, and Kubrick banned it for a while, yet it has managed to become a pop culture phenomenon and one of the most known work of Kubrick's films. Even the animated sitcom The Simpsons has parodied it. Collected himself a twiggy wig. Lamb, what say we go back to my place for a little of the old Luther van? Quirk Orange initially began when Kubrick was working on 
his film about Napoleon, a film Stanley wanted to produce for a long time, but never got the chance to do it. After reading the Burgess novel in summer 1969, Kubrick decided to direct the classic film of A Clockwork Orange instead. Early as January 1970, Kubrick reached out to Malcolm McDowell for the lead who accepted the part immediately after reading the book. In the same month, pre-production of the film started quickly with all the necessary preparations. The film took six months to complete, ending in March 1971, premiered in December 20, the same year. The reception of the film and the success it received were mostly based on box office number, not the criticism it got. It was considered cynical and controversial due to the film's content. I was absolutely mortified because, you know, I went to New York for the opening there, and, and I, that's what I remember particularly because, you know, I, I, I sort of crept into the back of the theater. It was um, Cinema One on Third Avenue, and you know, it was like the most prestigious house in New York, art house kind of. And I'm, I'm sitting at the back, and there was total and utter silence. Not one person laughed. Um, there was, when the film ended, nobody moved from their seats. They s sat there aghast. And, and I just thought, oh my God, they hate it. They hate it. And um, at one point, a woman uh, rushed out and I heard, threw up in the lobby. And uh, I, I just thought, wow, the, the people really. But of course, when it first came out, if you can imagine, you know, it's, this is, there was no, there was, you know, BBC One. I'm not even sure we had BBC Two yet, but an ITV, that was it. And so there was this movie that had this look and this, language and this music and this extraordinary things going on. Filming for Stanley Kubrick's next film, Barry London, took place in December 1973 and spanned over eight months, which resulted in a runtime of three hours and five minutes. Only Spartacus has a longer runtime with 3 hours and 17 minutes. It was then released in 1975. The plot follows Irish Beryl Linden, who wins the heart of a rich widow and assumes her dead husband's aristocratic position in 18th century England. An epic costume drama with Ryan O'Neill, Marisa Berenson and Patrick McGee among the cast. Thanks for being slow paced, it won four Academy Awards for its pioneering work in cinematography and costume design. It was at the time regarded by Kubrick and Warner Brothers that the film wasn't a commercial success. He was magnificent. He was breathtaking. I, I had a man love for him. I had three months of wardrobe fittings before we even began and yeah. sword fighting lessons in German and Irish. And then we shot for a year. I <laughs> loved Ireland. Yeah. I thought it was a wonderful place, but there were IRA incidences going on. And we were a British company. We had to change all our plates on our car. I wore an, Irish, I wore an American flag shirt around you so they'd not confuse me with the actual Irish. <laughs> Popularity with the film has grown since then and is regarded as another stroke of genius by the director. The PR, the costume drama, also has characteristic, the pessimistic narrative and tones that we have all seen from its other films, such as Lolita and A Clockwork Orange. Kubrick also had periodic music that included Joanne Sebastian Bach. Wolfgang Mozart and Antonio Vivaldi, Berlin reflects on the Western society. As the imminent war depicted in the film, it is also based on Vietnam War as paralleled commentary on political greed and social power. Based on Stephen King's horror novel, Stanley Kubrick 
released The Shining in 1980, starring How's Jack Nicholson in the lead as Jack Torrance, who takes his family of wife and son to a haunted hotel during the winter and becomes a murderous lunatic. Might be better to just play it as a medium shot with the situation. Can you do with your head down? Yeah. Well, that's not bad. Do that. <laughs> but many parts of it were very good. Let's look at it. Through here, I couldn't tell. I didn't think you got mean enough at the beginning when you said. At the beginning, at the you know, uh, trans translation point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the only, right many parts that the only thing. Come and look at it, Sean. The only part clearly wrong was at the end when you said, We've got to get him out of here, as you got strong at the end. And I think it has to be a last <clears throat> desperate begging, you know? And I still think you shouldn't jump on every single emphatic line. It looks fake. It really does. It looks like you, uh, Shelley, I'm telling you, it's too many times. Every time he speaks emphatically, you're jumping. It looks funny. So he says, I'll put on my suit and my suit. No, I think that no, line lays, is right. Right. When he lays down. No, I think that line's in the right place. Okay. Because, okay, Shelley, so you say, what's the matter with you first? Because what's the matter with you means, why are you so angry? What is the matter with you? It doesn't mean what are you talking about. Well, well this is where he lays down, though. That's the only thing I was thinking of. You know, when he flops back on the bed. Since that is new, I thought it, it fit, you know, what's the matter with you? If you, if you talk about <coughs> it, and then he blows up. right, I'd rather say it now. Okay. All right? I honestly okay. don't think the lines are going to make an awful lot of difference if you get the right attitude. I think you're worrying about the wrong thing. Can we just have a quick uh, chat about it once more? Stanley found out that I was on the same lot that he was preparing The Shining. And he took me on a tour of the sets, which were, I had never seen anything quite like it before. Then Stanley showed me how he planned his shots. He had a Nikon still camera, and he had rigged a periscope that went from the lens straight down. So when he took me into a miniature version of all the sets of the Overlook Hotel, he could put that little periscope down into the set, and he could basically take a lot of pictures and plan where his camera was going. So I had a real tutorial that first day I went to El Stanley Kubrick began to work on The Shining in 1975 after Beryl Lyndon. Kubrick himself has said that he was inspired to produce due to that the father threatens to kill his son. It was the psychological aspect, a story about rage and fear, about the underlying horror, about ghost and the dark side of The Shining has perhaps become the most eminent of Kubrick's works. Regarding story and principal shooting of it, the screenplay was written between June 1977 and January 1978, while shooting began in May 1978. Just like his other films, no details were released during the production, meaning no interviews or visitors on set until the film was initial finished. It resonate with the audience as one of the scariest films made and still an enigma worth talking about. For once, it has also been known for the shots made with Steadicam. I'm Garrett Brown. I invented the Steadicam, which is a camera stabilizing gadget that was quite revolutionary in the 70s. My name's John Baxter. I wrote Stanley Kubrick, a biography. I haven't seen The Shining for 20 years. The last time I saw it was soon after we did the work. To me, these images are among the most evocative and powerful in all of Kubrick's work. From the very beginning, they tell you what kind of story this is going to be. It's a story of a, a, a single, weak human being 
moving into a world where he's simply not going to be able to handle what faces him. The image of Mount Hood there in the background uh, in the Pacific Northwest is particularly commanding. I think one of the, the great choices that, uh, that Kubrick made for this film. Films such as The Shining Kubrick was from the 80s regarded among the top edited in Hollywood campaigning with directors as Martin Scorsese, Steven Spielberg, Woody Allen, George Lucas and Franz Ford Coppola who all were dedicated to ensuring the survival of American film heritage. It would take another seven years before Kubrick would release another film. During this period, a rumor in 1981 circulated that he would direct the sequel to 2001 A Space Odyssey, titled 2010 Odyssey 2. At first, Stalin was ready to start production of the sequel and when the book by Arthur C. Clarke was released in 1982, there was no film in production. In 1984, director Peter Hyams released 2010, the year we made contact. The script was penned by Hyams and Clark and was directed in Clark's own vision of the story. Kubrick continued to look for a new project to film where he would explore the poetic aesthetic form of the film he would produce next. work of the screenplay was finished in mid-1983 of the upcoming film titled Full Metal Jacket released in the summer of 1987. Set in wartime, the narrative follows the two U.S. Marine privates Pyle and Yoke during their boot camp training led by an abusive general and experience of warfare in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. That's it, yeah. That's all I wanted to do was publish the photographs. And then the guy said, you're going to have to tell a story about these pictures. And I said, well, I kept a diary. And he said, well, transcribe it. And uh, then when we transcribed it, we realized that there was an extraordinary story about the Wizard of Oz, about the man behind the curtain. Yeah. That there's this story about this extraordinary genius that we all, we talk about as black eyes all night tonight. Yeah. Wow. They really were black. And powerful and piercing intelligent. and intelligent, yeah. deeply, deeply intelligent. And this, these extraordinary stories that got, that got created about him, some of them true, some of them not true. He, he becomes like the, the powerful Oz, this, this image of Stanley Kubrick, like the, the, in The Wizard of Oz that projected onto our consciousness was really just a Menchie Jewish kid from the Bronx. Well, the wonderful Lee Ermey, who plays the drill instructor in the first half of the film, uh, was oh, in a car accident. Brilliant. And uh, the steering wheel uh, broke, his, broke his ribs. He wasn't uh, hired to be the drill instructor in the film. He was hired to be the, the, uh, the, uh, the person oh, no, I know. Yeah. who teaches you how to march, the technical he, advisor on the film. And he was with the cast of Matthew Modine, Winter Donfrio, and R. Lee Ermey, among other, Ermey was the one who was cherished most for his performance. The film was also nominated for an Oscar for Best Adaptation. Its satiric approach with the tone of gruesome realism, violence, brotherhood, and dark comedy showcases the variety of the appreciated director also nominated for an Oscar for Best Adaptation, its satiric approach with the tone of gruesome realism, violence, brotherhood and dark comedy showcases the variety of the appreciated director. For me I can always uh, remember almost every part of the movie cut for cut, particularly the first half, which I thought was so vivid, and, and that was the great thing about Stanley Kubrick. Somehow he was able to create images 
which once seen, never forgotten. They somehow sear, sear themselves into the brain. And they are just, they're just uniquely his vision. And As a signature by Kubrick, it took a long period of time to produce a metal jacket as his attention of details was familiar. This led that Warner had to release the film in 1987, even if the studio wanted it earlier. The result for the delay was a production with 39 weeks of shooting millions of feet of film a cost of $17 million. The picture was also delayed due to the car crash the army was involved with, where he injured his ribs and face, just like Mudin did when he strained his shoulder and were out for four months. We've all seen the ads, Cruz, Kidman, Kubrick, three of the movie world's heaviest hitters, teaming their talents to make eyes wide shut. While almost no one has seen it, everyone is talking about it. When Tom Cruise signed on to star, he did it with his eyes wide open. He knew director Stanley Kubrick was a maverick who didn't punch a time clock. 18 months later, Tom is starring in the long-awaited film about lust, betrayal, and fear. You've been trying to pick a fight with me, and now you're trying to make me jealous. But you're not the jealous type, are you? No, I'm not. You Stanley Kubrick's eyes wide shut might also be called 1999, a sexual odyssey. Tom Cruise and his real-life spouse, Nicole Kidman, play a couple whose marriage is shaken to its core after she confesses her lust for another man. Furious about his wife's imagined betrayal, Tom starts cruising New York's sexual underground. For the final film, Stanley Kubrick directed Eyes Wide Shut with Nicole Kidman and Tom Cruise. The plot follows Tom Cruise who plays as William Harford who, after his wife, played by Nicole Kidman, tells her sexual fantasies, he embarks himself on an adventure with orgies, with the strong erotic undertones and the subtle, confusing. Which is scarier, knowing your wife is having an affair or thinking your wife is having an affair? Which is scarier to you? I think thinking that, do we know how, you know, you, you know here's a guy who feels very safe and secure in his, in his life, in his uh, relationship, and he's coasting. You know, it begs the question of, you know, first of all, is what is is it a sin thinking the thought? I mean, how much emotion? Ask know, Jimmy Carter about that. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> what is it? You yeah. know, and I think that that is a dilemma and a question that you know all couples have. Do you discuss it? Do you not discuss it? Is more destructive uh, to do that, or is it uh, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Nick said that people are going to look at your marriage between the two of you differently after seeing this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Nick. <laughs> this final effort as a director does not conclude a winner on top. Even if the story shakes out, it is the execution that makes the story struggle into the final frame. To everyone's surprise in December 19th, 95, Warner Brothers announced that Kubrick would direct Eyes Wide Shut. The film would be based on a screenplay by Frederick Ruffell. Harvey Keitel and John Malkovich would have to star, but John dropped out and were replaced by Jennifer Jason Lee. In the end, they were also replaced by Sidney Pollack and Maria Riccaccio. The production was filled with rumors with high-profile actors as Cruz and Kidman in the lead. Tom and Nicole complained that Kubrick overhauled the production, locking them from taking other projects. At some point, it was even rumored that Sidney Pollack would replace Kubrick on behalf of the studio. Stanley Kubrick was satisfied with the result, happy with what he had accomplished after 400 days of shooting, shortly after showing the finished film to the studio and close friends and family, he passed away at age 70. The film was Kubrick's highest grossing film ever after 2001 A Space Odyssey. It was censored for some parts and not overall considered a box office 
failure despite the director's efforts. Of the D.W. Griffith Award. But I'm in London making Eyes Wide Shut with Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman. And just about this time, I'm probably in the car on the way to the studio, which, as it happens, reminds me of a conversation I had with Steven Spielberg about what was the most difficult and challenging thing about directing a film. And I believe Steven summed it up about as profoundly as you can. He thought the most difficult and challenging thing about directing a film was getting out of the car. I'm sure you all know the feeling. But at the same time, anyone who has ever been privileged to direct a film also knows that although it can be like trying to write war and peace in a bumper car in an amusement park, when you finally get it right, there are not many joys in life that can equal the feeling. I think there's an intriguing irony in naming the Lifetime Achievement Award after D.W. Griffiths, because his career was both an inspiration and a cautionary tale. His best films will always rank among the most important films ever made, and some of them made him a great deal of money. He was instrumental in transforming movies from a Nickelodeon novelty to an art form, and he originated and formalized much of the syntax of movie making, now taken for granted. He became an international celebrity, and his patronage included many of the world's leading artists and statesmen of the time. But Griffith was always ready to take tremendous risks in his films and in his business affairs. He was always ready to fly too high. And in the end, the wings of fortune proved for him, like those of Icarus, to be made of nothing more substantial than wax and feathers. And like Icarus, when he flew too close to the sun, they melted. And the man whose fame exceeded the most illustrious filmmakers of today spent the last 17 years of his life shunned by the film industry he had created. I've compared Griffith's career to the Icarus myth, but at the same time, I've never been certain whether the moral of the Icarus story should only be, as is generally accepted, don't try to fly too high, or whether it might also be thought of as forget the wax and feathers and do a better job on the wings. One thing, however, is certain. D.W. Griffith left us with an inspiring and intriguing legacy, and the award in his name is one of the greatest honors a film director can receive something for which I humbly thank all of you very much. Most known for his obsessive directional style, Kubrick wanted to have control over his productions. This made his films very harsh to go through and to collaborate with, which meant that scene in a film could have a hundred takes before he was completely satisfied with the result. He did not get any Oscars, only a personal one. He has provided a charisma for the eye. Even if he has covered most genres during his career as a film director. With films like 2001 A Space Odyssey, The Shining and A Clockwork Orange, he gave us stories that were provocative and daring in its artistic form and realism. His style has been more about artistic and philosophical exploring than obtaining a structure in the traditional narrative. As he shaped his worlds, it was 
based on realism, cynicism, and satire. He covered several different genres and he created some of the best fictional worlds. Even if they appear abstract for the audience, they are something more of a experimental approach of the artistic craft. Stanley Kubrick gave us something for everyone, but the best of all, he gave cinema a new meaning.